Okay, good morning. Uh, any questions? Okay, so let me uh, start by uh, reminding you that in electrostatics, we had uh, seen the concept of a capacitor. To be more precise, you were already familiar with the notion of a capacitor since your circuits courses. Uh, but in electrostatics, we saw that the formal definition of the capacitor, which in uh, ordinary circuit theory, Uh, you have seen it as uh, this symbol that if you take the voltage here and the current, these are related through C dVc by dt. This is the voltage current re uh, relation at a capacitor of capacitance C. But in electrostatics, we saw the more formal definition of, it, of what a capacitor means. And generally, a capacitor is a system of two conductors, so conductor one, conductor two, that uh, if charged with uh, positive charge Q and here minus charge Q, uh, the a typical way of doing this is by connecting them to a voltage source. Remember that conductors are equipotential surfaces and therefore it suffices to enforce the potential uh, for the conductor on one point. If you do that, then the entire uh, conductor surface will have that same potential being an equipotential surface. That means now that there will be field lines that start from the positively charged conductor to the negatively charged conductor and they will be hitting those conducting surfaces at 90 degrees. So therefore there will be uh, an electric flux that will be generated in the space in between the space in between, by the way, has to be covered by a dielectric. So in the space in between, we have a dielectric. And why do we have a dielectric in there? Anybody remembers? So why do we have to put a dielectric in between the two conductors? That's right, to make sure that there is no uh, current flow from the one conductor to the other. We want those charges to stay on the uh, two conductors and not uh, give rise to a current that will uh, discharge the one conductor through the uh, space in between to the other conductor. Uh, so we need a dielectric in between and we defined the capacitance of this system as the ratio between Q over the voltage and having the electric field you can find this Q from Gauss's law as the electric flux on a uh, surface S that encloses the uh, conductor divided by the voltage between the two conductors which is basically the line integral of the electric field from the positive electrode to the negative electrode. So that was the formal definition that we applied in our examples where we were finding capacitances. Uh, so if you see what is on the top, this is a Q, it's electric flux. You see we integrate the electric flux density vector in Q long per meter squared over the surface S and therefore we are calculating electric flux. And we divide that by voltage. 
So this ratio is what we call capacitance in units of uh, farad. And farad is uh, nothing else but coulomb per volt. So this is what we saw with uh, respect to the capacitance. What is special now about this ratio is that it only depends on the geometry itself and the material that is involved, the material of the electric. The reason being that, as you remember in our calculations, the electric field is in the uh, uh, numerator and the denominator here. So for example, if you double, let's say, the charge Q, if you double the charge, you double the electric field, therefore you also double the voltage. So the ratio Q over V remains constant. And when you buy a capacitor, which is 10, let's say 10 picofarad from the store, that 10 picofarad does not change if you apply 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts, 5 volts, or 10 volts. It only depends on the geometry and the materials that have been used to construct that capacitor. That's what makes this quantity relevant and important and why we care about it. In addition to, of course, defining the voltage to current relationship in a capacitor. So this is what we saw in electrostatics. In magnetostatics, the corresponding quantity is the inductance. And the inductor The inductor that you have seen in circuits is a component like this. You see we're using basically the schematic of a solenoid to represent an inductor. Uh, and uh, you have used already this um, symbol L for the inductor. And we know that if the inductor has voltage V sub L, for a current I sub L, those two will be related through this voltage current relation. So we're interested in this quantity L because it controls the voltage current relation at the inductor. So it tells us how much voltage we can get if we drive current I through that device. This is what makes this an important and pertinent quantity. So how is this now formally defined? That is my next topic. And you will notice that it corresponds almost one to one to the definition of the capacitance in electrostatics. So let's consider two coils. C1 and C2. And uh, the first one uh, I'm using as sort of an active coil, that is, I drive a current I1 through it. The second one, I just leave it uh, short circuited. So I don't have any current in there. So I2 is zero. I don't have any current per se. So now, because of the current in the first coil, I will have magnetic field, magnetic flux lines that will be going like this. In other words, the current I1 in the first coil will create a magnetic field B1. That B1 magnetic field 
uh, can be found, let's say, from the Biot-Savart law. And uh, magnetic uh, field, I, uh, B1 is the magnetic flux uh, density. Let me just be precise here. Flux density B1. Uh, thus, this flux density can be found from, let's say, the Biot-Savart law. I will use here the Biot-Savart law just uh, because it is applicable to a general case of a coil. Of course, if there was a symmetry, as we will see in the examples, I would apply, uh, I could apply the Ampere law as well to find that magnetic flux density. But in general, this can be found from the Biot-Savart law. And for this coil, the expression of the Biot-Savart would be something like this, that B1 will be uh, the integral of all dBs generated, the elementary flux densities that are generated by every little segment dL on this coil. So every little segment dL on the coil will generate at an observation point its own magnetic flux density. Okay, so these are the DLs. So I have basically to integrate them all along the loop and uh, the expression would look like this. By the Biot-Savart law. And this current I here will be the current I1 in the loop. Okay. So the whole purpose that I wrote this expression was actually to show that the magnetic field will be proportional to the current I1. So if I double the current I1, I double the magnetic flux density. If I triple current I1, I triple the magnetic flux density. So my conclusion here is that this B1 will be proportional to the current I1. Okay. So now, two things happen with this magnetic flux density. Some of it is intercepted by the circuit itself, as you see. So, so the flux density is generated by the first coil. So flux that is generated by coil one first is intercepted by the coil itself. And that's exactly what an inductor is. Just like the capacitor is a circuit that creates electric flux that it intercepts. So for example, the parallel plate capacitor creates electric flux in between its plates and the flux flows where? In between the plates. So the capacitor itself intercepts its own electric flux. And that ratio Q over V is this pertinent quantity that we call capacitance. Here we have exactly the same for magnetic flux. It is generated by C1 and clearly some of it is intercepted by C1. There we are. You see the magnetic flux lines come out of C1 and some of them are actually intercepted by C1 itself. 
So if I call S1 the area of the circuit C1, the magnetic flux that is going through the circuit the magnetic flux through this area uh, C1, area S1, sorry, I call it phi1 and it is B1 DS1. Notice that if I divide this flux by the current I1, I'm getting a quantity that is independent, totally independent of the current. That quantity is called the inductance of the coil one. So inductance is this flux phi one divided by the current I1, which because of the dependence of the magnetic field on the current will be independent, independent of the current itself. I will put on the board the general expression, it will have two integrals. The whole point I'm trying to make is indeed that this will only depend on mu, the magnetic permeability of the material in between, and the geometry itself, which will affect the integral, but not on the current. So you see that will be a surface integral of that integral over there, which has the mu, the I1, are prime cubed, and you see that the current cancels out. So therefore, we have a quantity that is only dependent on the magnetic permeability. Let me just put it in a different color so that we see it more clearly. And overall, the geometry of the, uh, of the circuit that will affect the DLs and the Rs and so on. So this depends only on geometry. And of course, the magnetic permeability of the circuit. So this is the formal definition of the inductance. Here's an example. And uh, to honor the fact that the, um, that, um, the circuit symbol of an inductor is a solenoid, I will calculate the inductance of a solenoid. Uh, so the solenoid that we that we uh, solved last week with Ampere's law. So n turns per unit length. Uh, such a solenoid, uh, as we saw, with current I, he has a uniform magnetic flux density. If this is uh, the Z axis, the magnetic flux runs parallel to the Z axis. We showed this with Ampere's law. 
and we found the magnetic flux density to be for current I mu times n times I in the z direction. So let's consider a solenoid of length L the number of turns will be n times L or equivalently the turns per unit length that appear in the expression of the magnetic field the magnetic flux density will be n over L and therefore the magnetic flux will be mu times n over L times the current I in the z direction. So what happens here? We have all these turns of the solenoid and for each turn let's consider just one turn like this one that has a circular cross section And let's consider a radius A. So every turn of these N turns will intercept magnetic flux from the magnetic field that flows uniformly through that turn. So we have a magnetic flux through one turn, which is this integral b dot ds. But now this integral is very simple to calculate because the magnetic field is constant. The area of the turn is the area of a disk of radius a, it's pi a squared. So therefore the total flux is nothing else but mu times n times i divided by the length l times pi a squared. So this is the flux that goes through one single turn. But I don't have one turn, I have n turns, so the total flux through the solenoid is n times the flux of one turn. And that is equal to mu times n squared times pi a squared divided by L times i. So this is now the inductance, the ratio between the total flux intercepted by the solenoid. See the uh, correspondence between this case and the capacitor. The solenoid is fed with a current. It generates magnetic flux and it intercepts its own magnetic flux. So here we have a kind of inductance that we call self-inductance. Self-inductance is basically all the inductances that you have seen in circuits where you feed a, a coil that generates magnetic flux, it intercepts it. So the inductance here, L, will be the total flux divided by the current and now you see what I said before, what I showed before in abstract form with all these integrals that may have seemed scary but at the end the calculation is no more difficult than the cal calculation of capacitances that we saw in electrostatics. So here you see that once I divide the current out the expression that I get actually does not depend on the current anymore. That's why it becomes an important expression that I can buy a capacitor of one nanohenry and that is one nanohenry guaranteed no matter what current I am uh, feeding the uh, inductor. Uh, so let me just write the expression 
which is this one. And yes, please. Uh, well, because this this abyss will be uh, z hat uh, r d phi dr. So if I wanted to do this formally, if I want to do formally the integration, uh, I would need to put here the z hat and ds as a vector as well, which would be the vector pointing normally to this disk. Uh, so I didn't do the formal integration because here this is a trivial case. The magnetic flux is constant over the area of the disk. So I just multiply the uh, constant value of the magnetic flux density by the area of the disk. But if that confuses you, the, the uh, full uh, derivation, let me just put it here for reference. So we have uh, this magnetic field flux density, sorry, z hat, then I should take the dot product between this and uh, uh, r d phi dr, and phi would go from 0 to 2 pi, r on the disk from 0 to the radius of the disk, z dot z is equal to 1, this comes out as a constant, nu n, I over L, and then I have the RDR from 0 to A, that will give me uh, the A squared uh, over 2, and then I have 0 to 2 pi d phi, that will give me the 2 pi, and multiplying those two, you get the pi A squared, which is the area of the disk. Right, so here we have this uh, formal calculation of the flux. So we have this uh, disk. It's a little bit hard to see. The magnetic flux uniformly flows through it and gives you this uh, the magnetic flux density flows uniformly and uh, gives you this uh, total flux. Okay, so this is uh, the inductance. Uh, in uh, structures like the solenoid, uh, where you have n turns and magnetic flux flows through each of these turns, as you see here, we need to calculate the flux through one turn and then uh, find the total flux multiplying uh, the flux through one turn times the number of turns. There is a name for this total flux that is called the flux linkage. So this uh, phi total which is number of turns times the flux through one turn has this uh, special name, which is uh, lambda flux linkage, and which I mentioned only because it is in the textbook. Uh, I, there is no particular meaning in this flux linkage. It just means that if you have n turns, you multiply the flux through one term times n. That's it. There is, there is no other <laughs> significance uh, in, this, uh, in this quantity. And uh, if you never use it, that's also OK. It ba basically means total magnetic flux. OK? So any questions? Questions up to this point? So this is the first type of inductance. Uh, this type of inductance is called self-inductance.
where the flux is calculated through the circuit that generated the flux. And uh, this is what you are most familiar with. However, if you refer to uh, this schematic over there, there is also another type of flux because magnetic flux lines are intercepted by the neighboring circuit. And this is a very important type of flux. Uh, for example, when uh, an aircraft lands, it goes through magnetic fields that are generated from the ground, from transmitters of uh, mobile phones, uh, I mean, mobile communication system transmitters, base stations, radars, other communication systems on the ground, defense, um, air, air, uh, aircraft control, tra air traffic control systems, and so on. So the circuits on the plane are actually intercepting this flux. And just like in self-inductance, V is equal to LDI by DT, this kind of in inductance where now one circuit generates the flux and another circuit intercepts it, actually can induce noise on those circuits. And this is one of the threats on aircraft electronics that are uh, being certified when, uh, let's say, uh, Bombardier Aerospace uh, is selling an aircraft and the, before the aircraft leaves uh, the Downsview factory, it has to be certified that when it lands, that noise that is being induced by this kind of mutual inductance, as we call it, will not desensitize aircraft electronics. Very important kind of an effect where now C1 creates the flux and C2 intercepts it. So this is what we call mutual inductance. So this is my uh, second case. So again, flux density generated by C1 is intercepted by C2. This is what we call mutual inductance. Uh, again, the schematic is this, so we have C1 and then we have uh, C2 and that C2 has its own area, S2. The flux is generated by the first circuit and as you see some of it will be intercepted by the second circuit. So that flux now will again be proportional to the current I1 because still it depends on the first magnetic flux density. So therefore, again, that will be proportional to I1. Hence, if I divide out I1, I can define another type of inductance, the mutual inductance between the two circuits. I call this L12 mutual inductance. That formally is defined as B1.ds. So you see now I integrate over the, the area of the second circuit and I divide by I1. So that again is independent of I1.
That, again, is independent of I1. Very important um, type of a mutual inductance with many, many applications. In the old days, I think I have mentioned this before, when you were picking up your phone, many times you could hear someone else's uh, conversation. And that was precisely because in the DSL technology, uh, they are twisting wires that correspond to one circuit, and then they are twisting wires over multiple circuits. That was a digital subscriber line technology that we had in Canada and Bell was supporting uh, even a few years ago. Uh, and in that case, you have one circuit through its currents generating magnetic flux that is intercepted by the other circuit. The mechanism for the induction of this noise is what we will see next week, Faraday's law. That is time varying magnetic flux through a circuit introduces electromotive force, i.e. voltage, that is current, that is signal, that can be picked up by your receiver circuit and then you get to hear the discussion of the, the conversation of another customer as a noise on your own conversation. So all these are really uh, enabled by these mutual inductances. So to give you a practical example of a mutual inductance, let's uh, consider a wire along the z-axis with current I. So this is what we call line current I along the z-axis. So I'm going to compute the mutual inductance between this and a frame of height h height h and width w. All of them, both of them, are in free space. So the mutual inductance will basically show you the coupling between the wire, let's say you have you are passing by a telephone cable, you're passing by a telephone cable, and you are carrying your laptop, which has circuits inside. The circuits inside, those closed circuits, similar to this frame, will actually capture some magnetic flux lines. And as a result, there will be noise induced by the wire onto the circuit. You remember the magnetic field that this generates? So the infinite line current The infinite line current uh, generates a magnetic flux density, which is mu naught times I by 2 pi R in cylindrical coordinates in the phi hat direction. So the magnetic flux lines are actually flowing in circles around the current. And uh, if this is at a distance r equals a, and having width w, it extends from a to a plus w. Okay. 
That frame will also intercept magnetic flux lines. Let me draw them as axes that go into the, into the frame. Right? So as the magnetic flux is circulating around the current, it impinges on the frame normally and goes through the frame like this. So there is magnetic flux through the frame which is the magnetic flux density generated by the current mu naught i by 2 pi r in the phi hat direction. And I have to integrate that over the frame using the corresponding differential area element. The corresponding differential area element will have to point in the phi hat direction, the direction that the magnetic flux flows. And if you look at your um, aid sheet, that will be dr dz. It cannot be d phi. I'm fixing uh, phi, so it will be dr dz. Uh, this is uh, dr, this is dz, so we basically integrate through differential surface elements, moving them along the frame. So phi dot phi will be equal to 1. You see I'm integrating over r and z. For z, let's say I start from 0 to h, and for r, I'm starting from A to A plus A plus W to A plus W. So A is the distance of the frame of the left branch of the frame from the wire and A plus W the distance of the uh, right and uh, the right branch of the frame uh, from the wire. So this is uh, my integral phi dot phi is equal to one. I have a bunch of constants. Of course, the current is one of the constants as I would expect. This comes out, and now I have one integral from a to a plus w, dr over r, and then another integral dz from 0 to h. 1 over r, the integral is a logarithm, so mu naught i over 2 pi, the first integral gives me a logarithm of a plus w divided by a, and the second gives me simply h, the height of the frame. So now the mutual inductance that I'm looking for is this flux that I just calculated divided by the current, and it is equal to mu naught by 2 pi logarithm of, uh, let me write this as 1 plus w over a times the height h. So this is the mutual inductance between the two. Okay. All right, uh, so the procedure that I have applied in all those cases is that once I have the magnetic flux density, I simply integrate it over the area. If uh, it is a self-inductance, it is the area of the circuit itself. If it is a mutual inductance, the area of the other circuit. And then uh, I uh, find an expression. This is a very typical situation. If you look at this expression, and if you look at uh, this expression here, you see that in both cases, the flux is proportional to the current. The flux is proportional to the current. So then all you need to do is divide out the current. And then you have the inductance. And in the first case, it is a self-inductance. In the second case, it is mutual inductance. Okay, so that is uh, how the... Uh, 
computation of inductances uh, is done. Uh, any questions? Right. So I have uh, five more minutes. Uh, let me see. Maybe I will do one more um, example. Yeah, I can do the example of... Um, Again, it is a self-inductance example. So this parallel plate system that we had encountered as a capacitor. You have seen this as a capacitor. In fact, the circuit symbol of a capacitor is two parallel lines. However, those two parallel lines two parallel conductors and uh, say this is the z axis zero h Let's uh, define a coordinate system for this, uh, x, y, z. So x, y, z, y is into the board. Uh, magnetic permeability mu. So we have seen this as a capacitor. However, if you feed the two lines with opposite currents, as we uh, do in uh, printed circuit boards, where you have those uh, strips of conductors that are fed with currents, then you have a system that is very similar to the one that we solved with Ampere's law and uh, if you remember, that one supported a magnetic field only between the plates and zero outside the plates. So the magnetic field of this system is actually a mu naught surface current density J sub s on the two plates, J sub s here minus J sub s here. And you may notice that this is, again, a dual system to the capacitor where we had surface charge densities on the upper and the lower plates. So here we have current densities on the uh, surface current densities on the top and the bottom. We solve this with uh, the uh, Ampere law. The magnetic field in between is mu naught Js y hat. So there are magnetic field lines that flow in between like this, and it is zero elsewhere. So if we look at the cross-section of of this circuit, what we see is This surface current density here, the opposite current density coming towards the left on the lower conductor, and then the magnetic flux lines that are going through like this. So all this magnetic flux is intercepted by this area of height h 
and let's give it also a length L. This magnetic, uh, uh, this uh, sorry, surface current density, if the total current is I and the width is W, the current density J sub S is equal to total current divided by width and flows in the X direction. Because remember, surface current density is related to the current through the following relation. If the current density flows along a width W, Current divided by width is the current density. So here, I over W is the current density. So now, I can write this flux density mu naught I over W in the Y direction, and I have the total flux through this area. We have a similar situation to the first example. Magnetic flux density is uniform, so I don't need to do any integral here. It is simply a multiplication of this constant magnetic flux density times the area. And the area is L times H. So I have here inductance, phi over I, inductance, self-inductance of the system, which is mu naught L times H over W. So this is the inductance of the system. Uh, you see, that uh, actually uh, brings to mind that one last comment. That if you look at this system, it has both capacitance and inductance. Both capacitance and inductance. So if I want to draw an equivalent circuit of this parallel plate system, that would be something like this. The L is what we just found. The capacitance is what you know, epsilon times area of the plates, which is W times L divided by separation. Uh, so it is not as simple a system as you may think. Uh, so it has both a capacitance and an inductance. So I'll stop here. I'll stick around if there are any questions. And uh, otherwise, we'll continue with uh, the related question, we saw that in capacitances uh, there is electric energy stored and we will see that inductors store magnetic energy. So we'll do this on, uh, uh, in the next lecture. Thank you.